Hello, folks, and happy holidays from Street PX. It is December 29th, episode number 54, I believe. We are going to be featuring Jock McDonald, local Bay Area photographer and uh, one hell of a jet setter when it comes to traveling for photography. He's got some great projects to talk to us about today. Uh, you might notice that the sounds a little different than normal. Um, that is because I am recording on my uh, little mobile unit here. And uh, I know in the last episode, we had promised to do a bit of a recap over the year. Uh, unfortunately, we are both traveling right now, so that's kind of made things a bit difficult. Um, but uh, we will be getting to that at the first of the year. But for this episode, we wanted to jump right into it. Um, but before we do, do want to give a little shout out to our wonderful sponsors, Glass Key Photo. That is San Francisco's premier analog photography store. That's located over at 1230 Sutter Street, uh, right off Van Ness. And uh, they're open seven days a week from 12 to 6. So go in there, check out their stock, grab some film, and say hello from us here at Street PX. Um, and uh, yeah, that's about it. Let's jump into this interview, a previous interview we had done with Jock McDonald. <laughs> Gook it up. Yeah, we can start it. Yeah, have any? <laughs> that always happens, man. Jim JB. <laughs> and let's go ahead and get the old headphones on. All right, let's do it. How you doing, buddy? Good to be here. I'm doing well. Yeah, welcome to the show. Yeah. Thank you much. Yeah. So we're just gonna, as we do with all of our episodes, just start with that introspective part and find out the origins of Jock. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, if you guys figure that out, tell me. I'd like to know. Yes, well, we got about eight hours to get... No, I'm kidding. Right. <laughs> Start that kind of microbiography. Well, um, you know, growing up in Canada, I think we're influenced by where we're from. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I grew up in Vancouver, and my mother was a painter and an artist, and my father was an engineer. And I watched my mother go through art school, and, um, you know making chess sets with acrylics and painting and figuring out, you know, her journey, I guess. And both my parents, I have to say, were never put the kibosh on being an artist. Mm. They really were disappointed when I didn't go to college. That sent off a whole uh, thing, particularly for my father. But, um, you know, parents were divorced and there was a pivotal moment in my life when I was 12, this is suburbia, Vancouver. My mother, Veronica, and her best friend, Marge Matthews, were sitting at about 5.30 at the kitchen table, and the streaker song came on. And my mother banged her hand on the table and goes, I have never streaked. <laughs> and Marge goes, me neither. And I'm looking at them in terror. <laughs> it's like, this is a fun conversation. And the next thing I know, the three of us are running around naked in suburbia Vancouver, you know, watching my mother's breasts fly in the wind. And, and what struck me so hard was you can change. You don't have to be set in your life. Uh -huh. And it was a real marker for me. Not that I'm running around neighborhoods right, naked. Right, but, right. but the fact that, you know, my mother, who was somewhat of a conservative person, would jump in in that way mm -hmm. was a real moment for me just and flip the switch on just, free spirit yeah, like hey let's go there yeah and uh and she was through my life uh she died in 91 uh she fell tragically off a cliff in france and was killed oh, no. um but i do wager that death is the reminder to live well mm -hmm. i i take i've had a lot of people you know move on as they say and and I think, again, you know, change is, is I think, uh, one, that is important, and two, it keeps it interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And without that, you, there's kind of no incentive to get anything done in the meantime. Yeah. And the job of the artist is sort of to propose, how about it? Or right. have you thought of it this way? Mm -hmm. Or, um, and uh, I like that aspect of art. I like sort of the poke and the prod and, and uh, that it's about ideas. Right. Mm -hmm. So the introspective part also is that it's very difficult to reinvent yourself if you're surrounded by people who've already figured out who you are. 
because they're not going to let you change because mm -hmm. it makes them uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My best friend, you know, Martin Philp, when I graduated, he was in my photography class in high school, much better than me. He looked at me when we graduated, he goes, what are you going to do, Jock? Now that you're getting out of, you know, school, I said, I'm going to become a photographer. He goes, how the hell are you going to do that? <laughs> This is my best friend. <laughs> I'm like, don't do that because I might have to do, with, do with it. friends we, like these, right? You know, <laughs> so, you know, my mother remarried and uh, married a very eccentric man, uh, Rene DeRosa, who uh, uh, was an art collector in the Napa Valley. Uh, the house is now a private museum called the DeRosa Preserve. And then coming into that environment was a real pivotal moment as well. I guess I was 13 or by then. And, um, came into the house and there is literally art on the ceilings and everywhere. And a lot of it is quite provocative and some of it is sexual, not all of it, but, mm -hmm. and when I first walked into the house after my mother had looked me deep into my eyes, cause I had scared off quite a few suitors by looking them deep in their eyes and saying, what do you plan on doing with my mother in a prepubescent squeaky voice? Right. <laughs> they never call again. And my mother looked me deep into my eyes and said, if you fuck this up, you're in trouble. <laughs> So when I met Renee, I, I, I just said, yes, sir, and looked him in the eye. And I don't think we spoke really for about six or eight months. And uh, he snapped action, as my mother did, and sent me to boarding school in Canada. So, um, But when wow. I walked in that house um, and looked left and looked right at all this crazy Northern California funk art, I thought to myself, I must rescue mother. In a very Freudian kind of way. <laughs> right, right, right. But I was immediately shipped to boarding school, so there was no rescuing going on. But... They entertained a lot, and I met a lot of artists, people like William Wiley and uh, Robert Arneson and Joan Brown and all the, you know, Roy de Forest, and I got to photograph them. Um, oftentimes, I wasn't at the table having dinner. Sometimes I was, but, you know, I was either parking the cars or serving the meals, but I was around it and yeah, got to proximity. hear the conversations. Yeah, And one of the conversations that struck me was that one probing question which is what makes art what is it it's a pretty broad brush question yeah um, but al farrow who is a sculptor and became a mentor of mine who does uh reliquaries in guns and bullets they're extraordinary statements about the violence in america under the banner of god mm -hmm. not not just in america but in the world so he makes mosques and cathedrals and that huge you know, he's doing the White House right now. Large scale. Uh, yeah. Large scale with real guns and real bullets. Oh, wow. And I don't want to give it away what the no, White no, House no, is no. going to yeah. be, but he had a huge influence in him. But Al Faro said a very profound thing about that question, which is art is made up of three things. One, it has content. It has an idea. Two, it has craft. It's well made. And three most importantly, is it has mystery. Because if it has no mystery, you only have to look at it once and you're done. You know, the Mona Lisa smile, like what's going on there? Or, you know, um, you know Michelangelo, David, the proportions of it and, and these things uh, allow us to return back again and again to it. And I think that's a, a, a well put way of stating it, mm -hmm. in, or at least framing it, I guess. So... So those would be sort of three deep, pivotal moments for me um, uh, around art. And um, I, my mother ended up being a painter and a sculptor. It's why I ended up being a photographer. I consider myself a lazy painter. <laughs> <laughs> I just, watching, watching the, uh, is it done, is it done, is it done painting, you know. Was and she oils, kind of acrylics? She did acrylics, she did oils, watercolor. She, Pretty much whatever she can get her hands on then. Yeah, nice. and... One of her big pivotal moments for her was <clears throat> she was sort of a really wanted to perfect watercolors, but she got tired of sort of being labeled the Sunday watercolorist. And so she took a deep look into herself and decided to paint her fears. And one of her big fears was burning down the collection by leaving the iron on or the stove on. Mm -hmm. So she painted these huge acrylics of things on fire and they sold. I mean, it was one of her more successful shows and, and uh, that went on. And, you know, people teach by example, by example, you know, not necessarily by words. Right. right. And seeing, you know, my mother go through that journey too, I think was also 
powerful, uh, a powerful stance of change. Mm-hmm. And for her, it was ironic to be, you know, struggling as in her own art and becoming an artist under the roof, literally, of a major collector with all these major artists coming for dinner and and cooking for them. And and so they were her friends, but. It's like this inspiration slash intimidation. It's also ironic, you know, to have her husband be this major collector. And that, how does that function? Mm -hmm. I mean, to this day, they're both dead and I don't know how that functioned. But mom had a say in some of the things that came into the collection as well. But, and Renee, my stepfather, bought some of her works and ended up in the collection. And and so it did function on some level. Mm -hmm. But um, it all kind of feeds itself some way, shape or form. Yeah. Now, you said you had um, – all of this is all transpiring there in Vancouver at the time? I would say, yeah, up until I graduated from boarding school, high school, in 1979 after a five-year stint uh, in Riker. It wasn't really Riker, but <laughs> – Sounds like I went to prison. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, I wait five a years between the ages of 13 and <laughs> – Well, when it comes to boarding school, like that's, that's what everybody's knee-jerk is whenever they hear that word. It's like there's this place that people just send – Problem kids or kids that you want to, you know, get. I mean, how was your experience there? It's well, like, I was borderline problem kid. Yeah. Um, the school was very much like the Dead Poet Society with Robin Williams. Mm-hmm. It was that kind of a school based on the English prep system. I just showed that movie to my kids, and then they were like, that's the school you went to? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Captain, my captain. Yeah, Captain, my captain, Carpe Diem. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, you know, it's a powerful movie. Um, yeah. So, these events were taking place up through sort of, you know, through 12 years old up to, you know, 18, I guess, when I said I wasn't going to college. And the dirt went into the fan and there was, you know, my father really was upset. But I just said, well, there's, it doesn't matter because I'm moving out anyway. I mean, I'm, I'm done. I don't want to live under my stepfather's roof. I was working in the fields, in the vineyards, which he had. And uh, sort of were, learned my really bad Spanish and learned that grapes, although are held up as this very you know, high, high esteemed esteem thing, yeah. it's still farming and it's a, it's a lot of work. And most of that work is done not by the people that own the vineyards. They're done, you know, right. yep. by somewhat marginalized people in a way. And, and you know, it's also very interesting during that time, a little sidebar, which was, you know, Joseph Phelps of Phelps Vineyards almost became my stepfather because he was courting my mother as well. But he was a very early proponent of building housing for the the, the teams that worked for him mm-hmm. and taking care of them. Mm-hmm. And he was a pioneer in that. And I've always been interested in the idea of other, I guess, or the early work of portraiture that I did, mm-hmm. or the rurals, yes. which I think you wanted to yes. talk about. Yeah, we yeah. definitely want to get into this. It came out of the original working title before it was called The Rules was called Faces of the Enemy. And the reason why I changed it is I, I, I think maybe I made a mistake by abandoning the title because it started in the Soviet Union in 19... I'm trying to think when I first went there. I guess it was late 80s into the Soviet Union. And I went... Because of the Cold War. I grew up through the Cold War Mm -hmm. and the Soviets were the bad people. And I'm just like, I'm curious. I want to go and I'm going to ride the rails and I'm going to go meet the Russians. Mm -hmm. Go to the belly of the beast, quote unquote. And so what ended up happening, which was kind of interesting, was an exhibition I did with a, a Soviet photographer named Mikhail Lemkin was a exhibition called uh, positive negatives. And it was a, a portrait show of people who had said no in a positive way. And it, on my side of the fence, you know, it went from people like MFK Fisher, who was a, a what was called a muckraker. She was a writer who called out the, the funeral industry to Bob Mondavi, who said, no, wine is positive. It's a good thing for your life to, um, it was a, a wide spectrum. I'm going blank on a lot of the names That's of the people, name. but there's more notables than that in the exhibition. Mikkel did the Soviet side of it and um, like Vaclav Haval and, and that. And the exhibition was done in the fortress of Peter and Paul where they held political prisoners. This is Leningrad? That's where Leningrad. Leningrad, yeah. yeah. It was before they changed the name. Uh-huh. So I f- 
flew over there a week in advance. Um, my, um, my fiance at the time was supposed to come over and meet me. And it was fascinating to be in the Middle Kingdom, which I love that term for the Soviet Union because it's not West and it's not East. It sits in the middle between those two cultures. Mm -hmm. And so the exhibition went up and um, it got a lot of publicity. It was my first real taste of being a celebrity because I was on TV and the news and on radio and I was recognized in the street and, and I found out how uncomfortable that is, yeah. particularly in a foreign country. When people are recognize you and speaking at you in Russian, and I don't speak any Russian, <laughs> except maybe horosho, which means good. Yeah. I don't know if you say that about 50 times. Yeah, sure. yeah. Good, 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 good. You just sound, sound like... Uh, just repeat it. You know, I'm now the enemy. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. But I'm you're, the idiot. But you're getting your first taste of fame in Russia rather than here in the States. Like, is that where the... Where, where the brunt of the familiarity was coming from on the artist side of things? Was it more Russians that were familiar with you before yeah, Americans? Yeah, in a very short period of time because right, right. of the media blitz right. that was done on it because the Red Army sponsored the show. Hmm. Well, so you commie, this you. was Yeah, this was <laughs> a real groundbreaking thing politically where it was being held was politically yeah. very, like, holy cow. Mm -hmm. And the American uh, embassy in Leningrad sponsored it and so it was a real sort of hands across the art table true bridge work yeah it really was was this when gorbachev was that? yes okay exactly That's, okay so you know glasnost was all yeah, happening yeah. And, and it was fascinating to be and i befriended some photographers who had been you know in afghanistan and they were you know it was really the wild middle kingdom I remember changing, I think it was 500 US dollars and I got a small suitcase of rubles. I'm not kidding you, a suitcase. I mean, it felt illegal and it was. <laughs> Did you have a handcuff on it? No, I, mean, I didn't, but I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> do it do doesn't seem very practical. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you what you do with them. You spend them. Right, all of them very quickly. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I had some very peak experiences when I was there. Um, you know, I play harmonica and sing uh, as my bandmates say, I scream on key, <laughs> and um, you know, uh, so like a uh, like like heavy metal folk, <laughs> yeah, right, <laughs> blues heavy metal. There you go. <laughs> and my friend Gena, who now works, you know, he's been in the news reporting for years, but he found this out and he really wanted to learn harmonica, so I kept teaching him this, and I handed out a bunch of harmonicas. But we ended up in a club in Leningrad called Rock and Roll, was the name of the club, and we went out. It was very fancy and. Uh, and I came back and said, it's all set. You're going to set in with the next set. And I'm like, well, okay. You know, this is a 30 piece band up there, um, wow. playing rock and roll and blues and, you know, Chuck Berry. And anyway, um, I got up and, uh, did, uh, the thrill is gone. Uh. It was so prophetic because I think the next two days later, the fiance said, I'm not coming over to meet you. I've fallen in love basically with your best friend and it's over. Oh, oh, my God. so I, you know, spiraled into holy cow land and uh, I really, I think I truly became crazy at this moment. I'm not kidding you. So <laughs> you weren't before? It's well, just kept coming up to it? Well, maybe it was just an amplification of what <laughs> yeah. was there, but I'll never forget that I asked to be, not live with Leonid and the gang anymore because they chain smoked and... Mm -hmm. I'm literally meaning, you know, 24 hours a day. Yeah. And I just asked if I could have my own space and try to get my head around, uh, around me. So they found me uh, a small little apartment on the outskirts of Leningrad. Now, I don't have a car. I don't speak the language. And I'll never forget going into the closet and pulling out a coat hanger and lying on the bed and sticking the coat hanger into my navel, trying to communicate with my ex. <laughs> okay. So it was a one way isolation. Is that? Yeah, this, was, this was a real low point for Jockey Boy. <laughs> anyway, um, I needed to get out of the city. Being famous and heartbroken, I think, is the worst concoction of a life experience yes, I've ever experienced. I can yeah. imagine. Everybody's coming up to you like, ah, so happy, and you're just. I was, I was devastated. Well, it's an undercurrent that no one sees. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, 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 the strange thing about celebrity them is they're recognizing you, but you have no idea who this person is. Mm -hmm. And you know you don't know them, but they're on the familiar. Right. And it's incredibly awkward. Um, 
So I asked Leonid and, and uh, Vlad, these guys, to take me out to the countryside. Just get me out of the city. I just, I needed a fresh break. And I had this one magic day out in the countryside where I think I took 27 great portraits, what I thought was that. And I edited it down and did a little book called mm -hmm. The Russians. And it has a solid metal cover and it's heavy like the Russians kind of are. And, uh, you know, I dedicated it to my mother because she died a few months after I finished getting back from the Soviet Union. She came out for the opening and cut the ribbon. And we had a great, it was a great kind of end life experience. I didn't know that that's what it was at the right. time, but right, right. it really was in a sense. And uh, um, she actually found my first portrait subject, which was a man who dressed in the in the monk's robes and the embroidery, and he was sort of an imposing. He looked a lot like Rasputin. That's exactly I remember the that image picture. that was coming to yeah. my head. Yeah. So this was the guy, and she said, "I've just met the most extraordinary man. He believes he found Noah's Ark, and he walked the, Car the Carpathian Mountains, you know. And and he said, you must meet him. You must photograph this man. So I met him, and uh, before I'd photographed him, I asked him. I said, "How did how did you? This is through translation." Uh, through Maya, who was our, our translator, how, how did you know that you, you found Noah's Ark? There was sort of a pause, and he said, through translation, by the smell. Mm. Meaning, I think, you know, dead animals, yeah. dung. Um, <laughs> yeah. I didn't go much farther than that, because <laughs> he, he was sort of a very taciturn guy, but photographed him, and the door sort of opened for me. Um, because prior to this, I was just doing studio portraiture, like uh -huh. commercial advertising work. When I got out of high school, I worked in construction for a while, but I ended up getting a job working for a man named David Tice in San Francisco who did commercial advertising work. You know, we shot cars and food and catalog work and for iMagnons and fashion. And that's sort of where I really cut my teeth in photography. But this point of being outside of Leningrad in the, in the communal farms, using natural light, just engaging through eye contact mm -hmm. which is i think one of the fastest ways to change your life is increase your eye contact with people particularly oh, yeah. strangers yeah. and smile and smile yeah like engage like yeah. hey mm -hmm. and i learned that from the cubans the well, it cubans goes, it goes well beyond language period yeah it's, yeah it, Cuba, it go goes into well the cubans i love it they're everybody when i first went to cuba for the rurals they were looking at me so hard, I, it made me so uncomfortable. So I just right would, like, you. the ground becomes way more important. You know? <laughs> oh my God, the ground is fascinating. Wonderful dirt, wonderful I dirt. I love what you've done with the with this dirt patch. <laughs> and my friend is like, no, the Cubans look at each other because they're coming from a place of, we are here. Yeah. And I think in North America, when we get into that in a smiling way, way you break down a whole bunch of barriers mm -hmm. and you literally i think can change a person's day mm -hmm. in it and it, so it's something i play with not daily but definitely weekly i'm like today's the day high eye contact <laughs> and photography i you know when i do it um i mean i do some digital but i mostly use the hasselblad and the hasselblad has a waste viewfinder which means i'm looking down to it but i still i don't have a camera in front of my face when i'm taking the right. picture it's me and you eye to eye. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a game changer. At least for me, it is. Well, it's kind of like the, the Vivian Mayer. Yeah, she yeah. used that uh, twin lens reflex. And there's... That was a Roloflex. A Roloflex, yeah. 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 yeah, exactly. And But you do. You, you, you can gain a different type of connection having the camera out of, your, out of the way in that regard. Now, I like the idea that a great portrait is usually a wonderful conversation with a camera present. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm that the emphasis can't just be on the photography. It, I think it has to be on the humanity or or some moment, you know, the famous Joseph, but harsh moment with Winston Churchill and he's trying to photograph him and it's not going away. And then he's tick, tick, tick of the clock and and you just reach forward and pluck the cigar out of Winston Churchill's mouth. And, you know, Winston leaned forward with that bulldog look and that's the shot. So, um, yeah, that was a real moment for me out there in, in the communal farms doing the, the portraiture. And another thing that I think is a fascinating aspect of American or North American culture is that we're so project driven. Yeah. That when I got back, people were like, what are you doing? Are you doing a book or a show or what? And I'm like, no, I'm not doing anything with them. Well, like we just started before this show, the first thing we asked you yeah. is, do you have anything yeah. where you're And I on? said, I'm in a very introspective kind of a place. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at, you know, 
basically the values of America. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. uh, and I can talk about a little bit about it, but, you know, it's titled Dollars and Cents, like making sense of something. Mm-hmm. And um, I used to scratch my head a little bit about when people would talk about, well, what are your values? What are the values of America? And it's so simple. It's just what we value, mm-hmm. what we put first. And I think in America particularly, we put the dollar first and then things come after it. And again, back to Al Faro, he pointed out, he said, you want to be very careful about borrowing money. When you go in and you get your driver's license, the first thing you want is a car. Well, you can go buy a $500 car or you can go into a new showroom and buy a brand new car mm-hmm. and put down $2,000 and have, you know, $25,000 worth of debt. But as soon as you do that, you got to go get a job so you can go pay for the car. Or they're going to take it away from you, right? So they got gotcha. you. <laughs> and the system is set up that way mm-hmm. uh, in a sense. And I, I think perhaps the values is changing somewhat, but... The concept is still there. The credit concept is still there, credit, credit card yeah. debt. It's a form of sort of financial serfdom. Mm-hmm. You know, buy a house. Oh, man. Go to college. Who, who, who's putting, paying... I keep hearing, you know, when I bought a house recently about three years ago, you know, there was like a frenzied time and real estate was like, well, yep, you didn't get the house. They paid all cash. I'm like, yep. What the hell? What is it in their mattress? I mean, <laughs> just there's yeah. that, see, they brought their briefcase of rubles with them. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe I'm being a little bit envious, but not, not really. I mean, I think that the, the real key to freedom is no debt. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh yes. And, and I think it's a powerful idea. I think for not just artists or anything, but for people mm-hmm. is, um, and um, so that's sort of what I'm spending some time looking at right now is how to uh, portray that mm-hmm. in, in a visual sense. In a visual like, sense, yeah. yeah. And uh, although I enjoy sitting here talking to you, Casper, um, I'm a visual guy. Right, yes. right. right. <laughs> this is this is audio, so it's hard to convey some things. But at the Let same me show time, you it helps these slides. Convey. Oh, just oh, this wait. This one is amazing. Just wait. Jim will start describing one here soon. <laughs> no, I promise not to. This, <laughs> I promise not. But but I do but I do want to get back to the rurals. It seems like your your um your experience in Russia was the foundation for this. I mean, you, but you've done more than uh, let's say uh, uh the Russia and Cuba. Were there other other yeah. areas you should? Um, so the rurals are. It was titled as I said, "Faces of the Enemy." Mm-hmm. Um, so I ended up going first to the Soviet Union and uh, did multiple trips there. Mm-hmm. Then I went to Cuba, again, under the sort of the guise of meeting, you know, the people that were behind, quote unquote, the Cuban Missile Crisis and right. Kennedy and all this, you know, again, the bad people. Our and this was your first time going to Cuba. That was my first time going to Cuba again. I guess it was 1990. And um, and then I went to northern China um, and... Uh, uh, I did the United States after that. Mm-hmm. I did Mexico, and um, I did Nicaragua because there was a lot of strife and turmoil. And at, at a certain point, um, I got called down on the carpet by the United States government for going to Cuba illegally because mm. I've done probably more than 50 trips in 25 years right. to Cuba. And I'll never forget in the interview, the letter was horrifying because at that time I was a, I just had a green card. I was married with two children. My whole life was here, and they were threatening me with fines and deportation and, you know, yeah. big, Some big stuff. stuff. Yeah, I'll never forget in the interview when they were going over my travel history, they're like, huh, Soviet Union, you know, nine times. Cuba, you know, 19 times. China, oh, four times. You know, they're like, why don't you go to Europe? <laughs> they're like, I mean, they thought they had a spy on their hands. <laughs> But your uh-huh. travel itinerary yeah. reads yeah. like one. You know, I, and I like to joke. I've done, you know, every communist, uh, uh, you know, country area. Um, you know, I've done Soviet Union. I've done Cuba. I've done China. Uh-huh. I've missed North Korea. We're in that. Uh, I just have to do Berkeley. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just right here in my backyard. Yeah. But, uh, uh-huh. Depends on the day. I see what well, you're saying. You know, yes. Yeah. So back to your point, though, is um, it really was – an education for me about going and meeting these people. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was fortunate in each of these countries to have someone that's from the country to take me around 
and get underneath what I call the tourist curtain. Right. You know, which yeah. is when you're in the hotel and you're, you know, you're going from, you know, tourist spot to tourist spot to tourist spot versus, you know, eating in people's homes and, mm -hmm. you know, going on to some underground dance party or whatever's going on and seeing what that is. And I, I don't remember which the French philosopher that said, though, the eyes are the windows to the soul. Mm -hmm. And when you look people in the eye and photograph them, it's quite profound. But the more profoundness comes out of when you return and give them their portrait. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's when the trust start. You're like, my God, you came back to, you know, this tiny little village in the Carpathian Mountains. You know, and everybody gathers around and looks at their pictures and say, God, you're ugly. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> some things just never change. But but the, but the familiar people, you you can you help build rapport or at least grow their own rapports because they show a picture and they'll make fun of one another and have fun with it. And you're, you're really kind of establishing uh, a community within the community. Yeah, I, th well, I think it's just a real step towards trust. Yes. It's yes. like, hey, there I took you your picture. You let me do that. I came back. I gave it to you. And there was a period where I did uh, several photographs of in winter and in summer mm -hmm. in the same spot or near the same spot because the teacher said, if you can show the passage of time in your work, that will be something significant mm -hmm. um so oh, that's a valid point just kind of sh yes that's very good so and so that i was sort of playing with that to a certain degree mm -hmm. um but i think that the, the the things that drew me to it was finding our humanity in the stranger or the the enemy uh -huh. and you know making lifelong friends out of people from around the world um i love uh, i don't know who said it but there's this wonderful short poem that goes they don't build one-seater sports cars. Someone needs to be sitting in that passenger seat with a martini in one hand and a bar of chocolate in the other shouting, woohoo, <laughs> as you go into the corners of life. <laughs> so true. And you, know, and you know what drew me to that series? It, it reminded me so much, and dare I say, Dorothea Lange's work with the WPA in the yeah. 30s mm -hmm. you know it, it it had it had that feel to love it. her work yeah it had that feel to it and it, you could you could tell it. i was going to ask you why you did this you know what we what you were trying to get out of and you just told me you, you know you were seeking the humanity mm -hmm. but i people. would also very drawn to dorothea lang's work uh -huh. and you know having heroes i think is an important part of being an artist mm -hmm. is you know built on those that went before. You know, you're sort of standing on the shoulders of those that have gone before you. Like, for me, Irving Penn is huge, and Dorothea Lang, and, um, you know, Gary Winogrand. I mean, my work doesn't fall in that way, but I think definitely influenced by that. Yeah. And, um, you know, Diane Arbus, mm -hmm. to a certain yes. extent. Um, so those things are definitely there. I mean, yeah. one thing I haven't said, when I was about... I guess I was 14 and a half. I fell 40 feet out of a tree and I broke my back. Mm. And up until that point, I was not scholarly. My talents leaned more in the athletic department, playing rugby or, you know, track and field and soccer. And mm -hmm. Well, you can tell you're definitely a Canada. It's so a I was laid up. <laughs> we just don't have rugby <laughs> yeah, down here. Yeah. I was, you know, end up curling, which is an amazing sport in Canada. Oh my God. I mean, <laughs> it's very interesting <laughs> yeah, to watch. It, it, it's, you know, throwing rocks with a broom. You know? It's like, that had to be invented somewhere yeah, we, where we I'm from. we still don't get it down here. So we we got to have ice first. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I was laid up for a year and uh, I read everything I could get my hands on about being a photographer. So Edward Weston's day books, mm -hmm. which are hilarious. You know, chapter one, I'm a deep struggling artist in Mexico. You know, <laughs> Cole has come down for a few days, a little toddler, and I've done some good work. I'm broke. <laughs> I need to secure a portrait commission. Hooray, hooray, hurrah. I've secured... Three portrait sessions for next week. Chapter two. Those rat bastards don't know what they got. I will never do another portrait as long as I live for commission. Chapter three. I've spent all the money and broke. <laughs> I need another it goes portrait on for twenty six chapters. Where you know what chapter is like? I'm a deep struggling artist, and I'm then I you know parties were amazing. We fired guns and drank tequila. Broke. Must secure portrait. 
I hate them all. I'll never do another portrait as long as I live. Broke. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I think you really need to do the audio book of this. <laughs> it, it touched me so, because it, it was so honest. Yes. Uh-huh. yes. Yeah. And, um, you know, and Carmel and Ansel Adams, and they sort of pop up. In yeah. it, and it was, yeah. But this really kind of started to drive you and started to get, give you a little bit more focus in what I don't know if it did that, but I started fantasizing about what it'd be like to be a photographer. Ah, Ah, okay. And it was the liberty of the traveling back and forth between Mexico and the freedom of that. Um, I read the entire Life magazine works, hardbound works on photography, the the great themes, darkroom technique. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there's 22 volumes Hmm. of of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I read The Zone System. Man, ah, that's a that's a read. Oh, I remember Only that read it one. once. Yeah, <laughs> I remember it took that me one. A yeah. year. The art of war for photography. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, it's so in detail, and I mean, that's the you know the chemical. Anyway, the way Ansel Adams lays it out. But mm-hmm. but you spent this time and I, yeah. recovering and learning, and then uh, also the yeah. history of photography because it's not it's not very long. Really. No, not no, really. Yeah, no. when you think about it. Yeah. Well, I mean, when you compare it to other forms of fine art, painting, and so forth, right. there's go a back complete... to Lascaux. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, so I, I feel I sort of gave myself somewhat of an education when that was going on, and mm-hmm. uh, and that uh, has helped because there was a period where I also felt that it was important to be naive, mm-hmm. which is so naive. <laughs> Drinks may be on water. <laughs> right. It's like, if I don't know anything, then I'll come up with something really great. You know? Oh, yeah. I started my. I started out that way. It's like, I'm not reading any books. I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to come up with my own original idea and then realize that, oh, everything it's is, been there's done. no such yeah. thing it's as an original way. idea. Yeah. <laughs> I listen to a, you know, musical track today and you're like, wait a minute, why does that sound familiar? It's because it's been sampled somewhere else. Yeah. So that that point was also a critical moment in my life. Yeah, being tr- laid up, and I have over the years done workshops and led people. And there was a a very bright woman who was a psychiatrist, and we were talking, and I told her that story, and she goes, "Well, have you ever thought of the fact that you were laid up for a year?" And you've spent every moment basically since that time traveling, like, you know, trains, planes, automobiles, hiking, (laughs) sidecars, motorcycles, you know. She goes, it's sort of a phenomenon oftentimes with people that have those kind of traumatic um, injuries where they're laid up and you're, it's so confining. Yeah. That Mm -hmm. when you finally get on the other side of no confinement, this um, desire to keep moving, the idea of, the sound of the wheels under I, I it resonated with me mm. uh, in a sense. I feel um, like you're kind of like making up for lost time, at least in your in your mind. Yeah, so I've got to go. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, folks. <laughs> so, wait a minute, so how old were you when you were laid up? Uh, about fourteen and a half years. Okay, so and you, you were down for how young? long? A year. A year. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, it was really terrible because he was a great, awful, wonderful logging doctor and had seen the accident over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. And he, um, after the x-rays came back, he's like, I can fix the break, no problem. He said, I'll plaster you from your hips to your neck, and I'll have it fixed in a couple months. He said, but the muscles will atrophy, and the spine will collapse, and it will fall on all your nerves up and down your back. And he goes, and I don't know if I'll ever be able to fix that. And he said, the option two, which I'll tell you to your face, is the worst option is we'll build a fiberglass clamshell and we'll ace bandage you up, which will support you, but won't allow the muscles to atrophy. And it is, you'll be in pain and I'll let you have painkillers, but if you get addicted to the painkillers, I'll cut you off. (laughs) And he was just like, and he's like, what do you want to do? (laughs) I'm 14 and and a half years old. Yeah, you're still a kid at this point. And I'm in, I got a, I'm messed up. Yeah. And I said, I, I, I don't know. I, I said, by the way, you're proposing that I need to go with the clamshell version mm-hmm. of it. And he said, I think it's right. You're young enough. I think is if you don't go down the atrophy path, um, you'll, you'll be good. You won't have paralysis or numbness, which there's a whole things that come with it. Yeah. And uh, so I did that, and I did become addicted to painkillers, and he did cut me off. Mm-hmm. And uh, as what happened, just with- he, he was one of those people that was like. You know, it was like Straight Atticus Fitch, you know, yeah. as a doctor kind yeah. of, but with a really bad personality. <laughs> but that's incredibly common. I mean, look at the opioid 
issue oh, yeah. epidemic yeah. that we have right now. We have we have created a generation of just people dependent on opioids, and and it's it's because of all the years of pushing it. Here's you know this will fix you. This will fix you. Look at the little white blob little thing that's mm-hmm. just bouncing along happy, and all these different pills that we just shoot down. It's a postponement of the pain too, yeah. in a way. Yeah. But it, the the other thing is is that I found is that is that. The journey of life isn't just the pursuit of pleasure. It's it's a full spectrum journey, which includes, you know, bawling your eyes out, getting hurt, falling down, meeting Mr. Gravity, you know, mm-hmm. Breaking meeting your back. Mrs. Right and Mrs. Wrong. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> and out of that comes, particularly out of great pain or great suffering, comes great empathy. Uh-huh. And out of the empathic perspective then comes connectivity to being human being in being in it That's, yep. and so the idea of avoiding pain at all cost is not actually the right plan i don't mean to seek it out either but yeah there's something about being in it when it's going on mm-hmm. and you know i've coming through you know a divorce two kids where i didn't see my kids for 6 months and had my hand literally on the idea of suicide. I'm like, this is so painful and that there's no guarantee anywhere that it's going to stop. Right. Mm-hmm. That's the part. That's the fulcrum, I think, where people lose hope. Yeah. And No relief on the horizon. Yeah. And particularly if you're young, you don't have any, you don't have any experience to, to compare it yeah. to. And com- comparisons are necessary. You know, I think... Our entire experience is built up of comparison, light and dark, near and far, rich mm-hmm. and poor. With well, develops hot perspective. And cold, yeah. yeah. To navigate life. Mm-hmm. So I think I'm not only a happier person because I get it now. I'm like, okay, I got my values in the right order now. Mm-hmm. My kids matter. My relationships matter. And eh, the money, it comes and goes, whatever. Being generous matters. And uh, And I actually came out of it. Because I told a few people that I had my hand on the door of suicide and the courage, not to pat myself on the back, but the courage to admit it, I yeah. guess, is also a, a big part of what made my life even better. Because those friends, you know, it's like that terrible joke that how many people could you go to and say, I need $10,000, you know, in your car, no questions asked. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, how many are those kind of people? Well, those are those kind of people in my life. And I'm lucky to have three or four of those people. Yeah. Um, and again, to default back to relationship and, and um, you know, navigating life with, you know, vulnerability, I guess would be the other big word mm-hmm. in my that if you want to have a great relationship with anybody, you're going to have to be vulnerable. Yeah. You're well, you going to have open. to come in it with the truth and say, hey, I may look like this or whatever, but this is actually what's going on. Or, or I'm broke. Or I, you know, let's go out to dinner. I can't. I don't have the dough. Or whatever it is, out of that is what builds the intimacy. And the intimacy is what makes the relationship real mm-hmm. and, and that. And when it comes back to trust, like you were talking yeah. about. Yeah. And I think the same applies to, you know, the journey of being an artist is being vulnerable with yourself to a certain extent. And, you know, looking at it, I mean, when I went from making a really great living as a commercial advertising photographer, I was always doing my fine art, but the commercial work paid for it all. So right. yeah. So I used that as a yin-yang kind of thing. I did the commercial work because I liked it, but I could then fund going to the Soviet Union and doing an exhibition and going to Cuba. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't have to go for grants. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I applied for a lot of grants, but I never got them. And then I finally was like, oh, okay, I'm not doing that anymore. <laughs> yeah, this yeah. isn't yeah. working. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just yeah. figure out a different way to find I think this. my punctuation is wrong. That's why I'm not getting the, the money or something. <laughs> no, so. off, your, off your commercial, you're talking about your, uh, including your celebrity portraiture, right? Yeah. So I made my living as a portraitist. Mm-hmm. and Which is yeah. very unique, your portraiture, really beautifully mm-hmm. unique work. Thank um, you. The, the Robin Williams picture with the mousetraps. It, yeah. I, I come back to that. I, that. When I was looking through your portfolio, I saw that image and it, it's such an amazing image because it shows anxiety. And I mean, there's so many emotions and, and feelings and such that that one picture provides in, in a simple way. Oh, well, thank you. That came out of Robin Williams doing that three picture deal where one of them was Flubber mm-hmm. and it all got panned. And I was sort of friends with Rob. I photographed him a few times and 
And uh, he was like, I'm going back to comedy because if I bomb, it's on me. But his contracts with the flubber, he couldn't change any of the dialogue. He couldn't improvise. And he said, you know, if a, a bad film goes out, is it the writers that get, you know, punched in the face for a bad script? No. Is it the directors? No. Is it the producers? No. It's the actors mm -hmm. that get the criticism. And so he was like, I just felt trapped. And so I went and bought like every, they're actually rat traps, but every rat trap in the Bay Area. And I, <laughs> when I got to like store number like eight, the manager goes, I need to talk to you. And he goes, is there something we need to know? Like, has plague broken out in the Bay Area? <laughs> Get rid of the rats. And the, you know, the best part is those those rat, those rat traps are all set. And at the end, Robin kicked one of them. And it was just like, I didn't, the, it was so stupid of me not to photograph it. Because they were like, everywhere. Da, 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 you know. Yeah, and, yeah. And oh, you didn't pull off a I would, No, I, I was shooting film and I oh. already called the rap and... Robin just kicked it and I was not ready, but it would have been hilarious yeah. as yeah. a little video. You know, I don't even know if you can, there's hundreds and hundreds of rat traps. And, um, but I always, you know, liked, I think one of the greatest things about being human is laughter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you meet somebody for the first time and then you laugh with them, like really laugh, that changes the whole relationship. Mm -hmm. And um, so I always like to inject a little humor if I can. So get a chance to kind of build a rapport with your client, or who you're working with. To get not necessarily get to know them, but get them laughing, get them comfortable. Yeah, I mean, the original idea I wanted to do with Robin was him just naked behind a solid silver serving cart. But his <laughs> his agent was like, "No nudity. We're we're not doing Robin. He's you know he he doesn't look good naked. <laughs> I, 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 he's like a bear." <laughs> I could see Robin doing that for you because he he wasn't well, he one would. to be afraid of. Yeah, it. He, he was really quite. Courageous oh, and fearless. Yeah. 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 But I don't know if you remember when he would take his arm and go like this and make it look like it was. Yes. I, I don't I need to go any farther. I think in most of his stand ups, because his arm looked like a Yeti arm. <laughs> no. No, you know, the portrait of Bob Mandavi, Robert Mandavi in a cork jacket came mm -hmm. out of his PR person. I don't know anybody who spends more time in a tuxedo than Bob Mandavi. And so, you know, made a tuxedo jacket with a herringbone pattern and corks and when bob saw it he's like oh this is so fantastic and he came out and he's like should i put the diamond studs or the black studs in my shirt and i'm like no definitely black studs black and white and he hadn't had his knee surgery at that time and he came out and he got in front of the camera and i lowered the camera to kind of make him heroic and and i just said you know bob mate, is it all right if i call you bob he's like yeah 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 I'll call me bob i said you look so uncomfortable he goes, yeah, he goes, yeah, my eyes, they're just, they're super itchy. And he's wearing the cork jacket, you know, he's got his hands in the sleeves. And I said, well, just itch him. And he said, he said, I would, but I can't bend my arms. <laughs> <laughs> and so I went up because the jacket was kind of fragile. I said, well, let, let me just, you know, I'll just itch your eyes. I went up and, you know, I scoochied his eyes a little yeah. bit. And I was like, they were a little bit greasy, but, you know, we got him set. And it, I, I think portraiture is quite an intimate thing, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. And you know, I photographed a Vander Holyfield and first Sega boxing at one point, and we flew to Chicago where he trained in the YCM gym and 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 that. And you know, the account executives like, when I meet a Vander, I'm going to do this, and when I meet, and the other was like, when I meet him, I'm going to give him a big hug. You know, when all when these a, dreams, all these dreams, and when a Vander showed up into the gym, everyone lined up, <laughs> <laughs> including me, yeah. and I'm like. Evander, you know, I'm Jack McDonald, photographer. Do, do, do you have any idea why you're here? He goes, I have no idea why I'm here. I said, oh, for Sega Boxing? He goes, I just told, I need to be here for two hours. Someone said, I signed this and I'll be there. So <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and all the kids were there and he was magnificent. God, he's just so gracious. I heard he was a sweetheart. Yeah. Yeah, I heard he's a sweetheart. He just yeah. was seeing him with the kids. I mean, what a love bug. Yeah. <laughs> I bet that was something that really kind of threw some inspiration. Watch, were, were you seeing the way he was interacting with the kids before you took the picture or after? Before. Before. Yeah. So you got a chance to see that personality. Because he spent like 30 minutes with the kids and then finally came over. And, wow. Uh -huh. Yeah. I mean, he really was with them. and Wow. It was just so great to see celebrity. Like, that's what it should be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, that inspiration, like he so started person. in that gym, just like those kids. And, you know, yeah. You, well, it's an inspiration for those kids to see, well, you know, we might not make it to this point, but we have 
the potential yeah, is the there. Yeah, the possibility. Yeah, I don't yeah. have to be stuck where I am. Yeah, yeah interesting. Now, let me ask you this, because I, I, I've got a gap here. How did you get from a 14-year-old kid laid up with a broken, with back? A broken back to shooting Evander Hol- Holyfield and Robert okay. Mandavi? The chronologic works, you know, in 19... 19- uh, 74, I went to boarding school. Uh-huh. I spent five years there. I graduated in 1979. I left Canada almost immediately for California. My mother, Napa. Uh-huh. My mother had remarried, Rene DeRosa. Okay. And I worked for him in the fields. You know, I also had worked for him in the summers too. And I realized I didn't want anything to do with that. I was also had a second job building houses in the Napa Valley. And I learned the trades. And I was like, wow, this is a lot of work. Uh, I worked in a foundry with Al Farrow, casting bronze sculpture, and mm-hmm. hanging out with David Best, who is a guy that builds the cathedrals at Burning Man. And oh, okay. so I was hanging around these artists, and you know, I was just a kid. And once I graduated from high school, I I I just moved out into a house in a shared house in Tiburon, and managed to get a job as third assistant when I was eighteen. I guess just turning nineteen with David Tice in a commercial advertising studio. Gotcha. So I worked for David Tice from the time I was 18 to 24, and I went from third assistant to studio manager, and I knew about billing, and I knew you know, how to get work, and I knew darkroom technique, and I could pretty much shoot anything. Mm-hmm. I didn't like shooting everything. And uh, David lost a major account, and, and I was gonna go to Europe with my mother and my sister to go visit relatives in England. And um, through friends, uh, I'll never forget, this is a great story. Okay. So I'm 24 and I put together a portfolio. I've been working in commercial advertising photography for six years. I go to England. My cousin's fairly well connected in England. And one of them is a hat maker to the queen. And her name is Jilly. I can't think of her last name. Jilly something. But she knew the rep who repped Helmut Newton in London. Mm Mm-hmm. And she's like, could you get me an interview? You know, like to be able to see. She said, yeah, sure. I'll, yeah, I'll call him for you. And she did. And I called and made an appointment. And I'd been in England a week. And it was just this lovely day in England. And I went down and to his office. You know, it was like 1030 in the morning. And the gal at the front, you know, said, hey, you know, I don't, Mr. Johnson or whatever his name was. He can't see you right now. But if could you come back in a couple hours and leave your portfolio? And sure I left you know I can't wait to meet helmet and be repped by you know helmet's you know guy yeah. and he'll be working in Paris and this is gonna be great <laughs> so it was absolutely a stunning day in, in, in England in, in London and I came back after lunch and she said you know Mr. Johnson see you now and I went back and he was on the phone I'm sitting you know like I'm sitting across the desk from you uh-huh. and he's talking you know maybe 10 minutes he puts the phone down and uh, he picks up my portfolio and as he's turning each page he goes you have no sense of design, no sense of style, no sense of color, and when you leave my office, I'll forget you. And he handed me back my portfolio. Oh my god! And I, 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 I just I couldn't believe it. I I'm not meeting Helmet. I'm not going to be working in Paris. I mean, I just stood up and I walked out of the office, and I'm not exaggerating. It immediately started pouring. I was like, and I, like I literally shook my hand at God. I was like, ah, damn you! I, I was like, ah. <laughs> And then two days later, I jumped in a swimming pool and sprained my ankle and flew home in, you know, like, I would have been big if I didn't sprain my ankle. <laughs> that was what it was. Yeah. <laughs> I needed a way out. <laughs> but I really was like, I'm done with photography. I, at, You know, oh been six God. years. and that, I mean, this is a top person who I respected, who knows his stuff. and Just shit on you. It just was like, boom, boom, three, you know, three yeah. shots. And yeah, yeah. Jockey's out of the game. <laughs> so I came back and I went and... Just started working in the foundry, at, oh. in Alice Farrow's studio, and I lived with him, and helped produce three shows for him. And then there was a real pivotal moment. I guess I was about six months into it, and my mother said, "I, you know, I'd like to have dinner with you." And I've already said I'm not going to college. I'm not doing the university thing. Uh-huh. They've already freaked out, but I don't live at home, and so they don't really have any jurisdiction over me. So I said, "Sure," you know, and I was very close with my mother. And she was cooking dinner, and she said, here's a piece of paper and a pen. I want you to write down the things you'd like to do in your life. What, what, what would you like to do with your life? And I thought about it. There's only two things that I wanted to do, and I wrote them down. And uh, the first one was to become a National Geographic photographer, mm. and the second one was to open a photographic studio. And my mother looked at those two things and looked me right in the eye and said, which one scares you the most? And I said, opening a studio. 
And she said, well, that's what you should do and I'll help you. Hmm. Oh, wow. So oh, I'm nice. 24 years of age and she co-signed two loans, um, $20,000 each. This was back in 19, when would that be? 85, 1985, 1986. Mm -hmm. And I found a building on, which I rented from a guy and I renovated it, sandblasted all the wood and, you know, this we one, did sheetrock, put in a... This one down in Mission? This, this is in San Francisco on Gilbert Street, 46 Gilbert Street, which is between 6th uh, and 7th off Bryant, down by the Hall of Injustice. Mm -hmm. Ah. <laughs> and all the bail bondsmen were down there. I mean, yeah, it was, yeah. you know, it was a Good real hood. Good yeah. company. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, and I managed to secure the building as a live-work space before live-work was really going on. Yeah. And, and they wrote into the lease, it was never the language was live-work, that I was a night watchman. Which I thought was a fantastic oh. turn of a phrase. I'm, I'm, I'm like, Watchman, yes. what are you doing over there? <laughs> oh, it's me. Yeah, okay. So I had a five year lease, and uh, Sherman McMillan was my landlord, and it was 900 bucks a month Ugh. for 2,500 square feet. Holy shit. Mm. And, uh, <laughs> and then he said, well, it will go up. Every year after the first year, a hundred bucks till it gets to twelve hundred bucks a month, and I was like done. So you know, I lived and worked there, and and um, so David Tice, six years apprenticeship is where I kind of learned my craft, and my mother's support of two loans, which I paid her back. And there's something really powerful about a parent that really believes in you. Yes, because mm -hmm. there was no way I was going to screw my mother on the loans. And I had no clients and I wasn't going to go take David Tice's clients. Yeah. So I did a lot of wedding photography, which I really don't like. I've seen some things at weddings that really are not really conducive to weddings. <laughs> Believe me. Right. Brother, I hear you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I did that and I did, you know, photograph cheesecakes for a cheesecake company and I, I did whatever I could, you know, but I was charging like $300 or, you know, including expenses, $500, you know, yeah. and shit, barely making it. And- I made a wish list of the clients I wanted to work for, like Levi Strauss and The Gap, and I want to shoot for San Francisco Magazine, and I wanted to work for Kit Heinrichs at Pentagram. I think there was 20 names on the list, and each name had a page in a binder. And so it would say The Gap, and then, you know, you could at that point just call up and get them to mail you their creative list, mm -hmm. and you would get the list. Lisa Prisco was the head, you know, that. Mickey Drexler was, ran The Gap, you know, you got the whole... So I'd be like, well, I need to get a hold of Lisa Prisco. So, you know, Lisa Prisco called on, you know, January 17th, left voice message. Called again, you know, February 14th, left voice message. You know, uh, finally got a return phone call. But anyway, it was like the history of the relationship mm -hmm. till finally. And they would be like, well, call me in a week. So I call in a week. Like, like until clockwork, finally yeah. Lisa's like, all right, all right, all right. We'll see you. You know, just you know, wear just them stop down. Calling. <laughs> and so I didn't, you know, get hired by the Gap right away. But I got in. I showed them my book. You had to go in and show your portfolio. Mm -hmm. So I got called by a small agency in San Francisco called Patrick Partner, Patrick Partners, and I went in and they, I'd showed them my my work, and then right in the, this never happens. Right after showing the portfolio, they were like. We have two shots we need to do for California casualty insurance. And here's the layouts. One is with a family, a son and a daughter and a father and a wife, you know, a family portrait. And the other one was like the trades, like a fireman and a police officer and a nurse and, you know, for two different insurances. Mm -hmm. And they're like, um, are you interested in doing this job? And I'm like, yeah. So this yeah. is their, your first time they're showing them this stuff. Yeah, I'm just looking at it. And, I, and I'm like, yeah, yeah. I'm, and they're like, well, what do you think it's going to cost? And oh, I could feel the sweat coming out of my hands <laughs> and out of my forehead. Like I could feel it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, just, you know, the internal dialogue, which we all have, you know, just stay cool. I, I'm not cool at all. I know, <laughs> just stay cool. I'm sweating like, like crazy. I'm, they're asking how much it's going to cost. And so I just looked them right in the eye. I said, it's going to be $1,500 plus all expenses per ad. And, you know, I'll, and they said, and I was waiting for him to go, you're not worth that. You're worth $300 including expenses, you punk. You've got no sense of design, no sense of style. And when you leave my office, I'll forget you. Oh, I was yeah. just waiting for that to come you back. Get that in the back of your head, yeah, of that's course. that's what's playing inside on the tape. 
on the reel to reel inside my tiny little brain. He scarred you. Oh yeah, I'm still talking about. It. I'm 56 years old. Obviously, I'd love to give that guy a hug, like a real hug. Look at me now. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, look at you. Can I adjust your oxygen mask? If I wiggle the IV, is that uncomfortable? Oh, so shit. they said, would you write it up and uh, let's figure out a time to do it. Oh, so they accepted they this right on the spot. Verbally on the spot. So you had no market buy. You had no idea as far as the distance this is going to go. No. None of and, this. and here's the takeaway. No one is going to tell you what to charge. No. Yeah. And no one's going to tell you you're charging enough or a little yeah. or that. And it's a poker game. And they can tell you, but it's never going to be right because everybody's pricing. everything. Every job is different. Yeah. But now it's really, really different because... When I was starting into photography back in the middle 80s, you know, there were probably, I'm not kidding you, there were probably 25 photographers in San Francisco. Yeah. Yeah. We were Literally. talking with Jay Blakesburg recently. Yeah. And he was talking about it was a completely different era. You could walk in and $25,000 jobs were normal. normal. Yeah. That mm-hmm. was not, un, that was yeah, common. You can't find that yeah. shit anymore. No, it doesn't exist because basically Getty stock yeah. Yeah. and the, the iPhone. Yep. Yeah. You don't, yep. photography is no longer a skill set. Mm-mm. It, it just isn't. I mean, if you asked a, a young photographer today, what is reciprocity? <laughs> They'll pull out their They're waiting. Eyes. They'll pull out their <laughs> iPhone and try yeah, to figure they, it out. Like, <laughs> I'm sorry, we've blocked your internet. What is reciprocity? So anyway, that's how I got that's how I got from fourteen and a half years old to opening the studio, got that first job, and then I realized and I just those twenty people, you know, Woody was one of the guys down at uh, Hal Reine and Partners. You know, I put a jacket and a tie on to go down and meet Woody. This, I mean, this guy was an icon back in the day. And, you know, Bartles and James. I mean, he he was a big deal. And I got in and showed him the book. And he's like, kid, your work's good. He goes, never show up at a creative meeting with a jacket and tie. <laughs> True that. <laughs> this, yes. <laughs> so, you know, and then I got my first, this was another misunderstanding. I got my first shoot for The Gap. And it was part of the individuals of style and they were bus shelters. And the smartest thing I ever did back in that day was insist as part of my contract of a photo credit on those bus shelters. Mm-hmm. So the bus shelters go up. They're only going to be up for a month. So I've got one month to get back on the phones and get all those people that were like, call me in a week, call me in a month, call me after Christmas, call me after the first of the year, call me later. I finally got them on the phone. I said, have you seen the individual styles, bus shelters that are up around town? They're like, yeah, yeah. I said, I did them. Can I come in and see you? <laughs> and they're like, yeah. <laughs> it's like a mobile portfolio. <laughs> right. Yes. I mean, exactly. Well said. And uh, so that broke through to a lot of the people I couldn't see. Okay. First domino to just fall. Yeah, to really... Get in, but the the great misunderstanding that I thought, and I think this is still true, is I thought that once you had a client like the Gap, they called every week. Mm-hmm. I didn't hear from them again for another year. Mm. <laughs> well, they don't have a you know a commitment to one artist or not. They no. just grab whatever comes to them in the moments. Yeah, but you know, Vanity Fair has a, a contract with Annie Leibovitz. I mean, they do they do exist. I one of my best clients ever was I don't know like a fifteen year run with Joe Boxer. I helped build Joe Boxer with Nick Graham. All those ideas. You know, like getting celebrity lookalikes with their pants down, like uh-huh. Clinton got a cease and desist on Hillary Clinton and, and that. We did <laughs> Einstein and, you know, it, we just had more fun than should be allowed. You got a, <laughs> wait a minute, you got a cease and desist from the Clintons? I didn't. Nick Graham Nick did. Nick Graham did? <laughs> yeah, he has it framed in his bathroom Brilliant. next to a letter saying, thank you for the underwear. Oh, with yeah. a photo Brilliant. of him. He met him yeah. and he goes, I'm Joe, you know, I'm Joe Boxer. Yeah. And Clinton was like... Did you get my cease and desist? <laughs> <laughs> and Nick goes, yeah, I got it. I framed it. Yeah, I, I framed it. it. It's <laughs> a one hug. Great piece of artwork. Yeah, yeah I mean, you know, we, oh it, we did it all. And, you know, Nick is truly, I think, a, a, a marketing genius where for fashion show, he has a new company called uh, Nick Graham. I was going to ask, are you still working with him and everything? I did. Yeah, yeah. we still work together and, and that. But I think he shoots most of his stuff on an iPhone now. As, but he did the shortest fashion show, which was the human cannibal in a suit at Fashion Week. <laughs> Over. <What? laughs> Money, yeah, they please. They shot, shot a guy out of a cannon, a human cannibal in New York for Fashion Week. Uh-huh. The shortest fashion show it was billed as. <laughs> then the other thing, this is another great story that didn't happen, but such a genius. When he was just launching um, Nick Graham, his, his uh, menswear line. Um, for Halloween, he 
was going to build, have made huge, like one or two huge bow ties and then a huge necktie. And when it, the bow tie was going to be underneath one helicopter and the, the big tie was going to be another helicopter in New York. And the third, there was two other helicopters with press in them. Oh, you, this huge, was on, you mean like freaking huge. huge. Now, hang on a second. You'll, <laughs> you'll figure out how huge, huge is. And so what there was going to be, this was, you know, uh, there's another fashion week around Halloween. And so the idea was to fly the helicopters, all four of them up, and get the two press helicopters in a certain position in front of the Statue of Liberty and then fly the necktie in front of the Statue of Liberty and take a bunch of photos yeah. and then do the bow tie. And that was going to be the fashion show. <laughs> so Nick... Nick hired a guy up in Bodega Bay to build these things because he supposed we had experience with flyables, right? Uh -huh. The guy never made the necktie or bow tie. I'd already, I got on aircraft to fly to New York to shoot this. Nick goes, I get a text, it's off oh. <laughs> with like a tear. And you're already on your way. <laughs> I'm getting off aircraft. I'm like, what? And so I flew in, had breakfast with Nick, you know, down in the Bowery or something and uh, then flew home. <laughs> wow. I would be curious of the copyright uh, when it he comes to- He had permission to... to do it. Yeah? Oh, okay. What a failed or a missed opportunity. I know. I still claim he should do it again. Yes. Yeah. Well, it hadn't been done yet. Yeah. So <laughs> no one's touched it. And he had permission from the Port Authority. Everyone had agreed to let him do it. Holy wow. Jeez. So, oh yeah. My God. But, well, I, I, I'm, I'm loving this, but I don't want to, I, I, I feel it would be a disservice if we don't get the Cuba ah, subject yeah, out here. Right. And, I, and I, I'm, I'm having so much fun. <laughs> Entiendo todo. Entiendo nada. Let, let us segue uh, completely randomly straight to Cuba because your work, you had mentioned earlier, you have been down here, down here, uh, down there more than 50 times. And so it's, it, to me, it's kind of sounding like a kind of a second home for you in many ways, at least the, you know, the amount of times you've been down there and the people I'm sure you've met. What was your, I mean, I know why you first went the first time, but what, what was it that kept you coming back? What, what really drew you back? Uh, Cuba. That's a great question. Um, the first time I went to Cuba was after I did a retrospective traveling show in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And I became friends with Juan Francisco Gonzalez, who was the Minister of Culture of Mexico. And he became a cultural mentor. And he's like, you're a gringo. You know nothing about, you know, Anything. Latin American culture <laughs> or movies or poetry or any of these things. So here's a reading list. You know, you have to read Ron Rolfo and you have to read, you know, these writers, um, you know, Thousand Years of Solitude. You, you, you have to understand the culture if you're going to be photographing it and and yes. i'm and i i was fantastic um you know books that have been made you know, like water for chocolate and you know mm -hmm. they made you know what do they call that uh, surrealist realism you know these ideas um and Juan rufo's book is about a ghost trying to find his past and doesn't know he's dead. And so he keeps visiting these places and no one recognizes him and everything's changed. And and there aren't any books that are written from sort of, you know, John Steinbeck doesn't write books like that. You know, Henry Miller doesn't write books like that. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and so my eyes were sort of uh, unveiled in a sense uh, because of one Francisco Gonzalez and, uh, and his guidance. And then he said, well, you're really never going to understand Latin America if you don't go to Cuba. And I, I was like, well, when do we go? He goes, I'm not going, I'm married. <laughs> he said, but my son Bernardo will take you. And I'll never forget his son Bernardo when his son was informed of this. Bernardo, his dad said, you're going to take Jock to Cuba. And I could see all over Bernardo's face, I'm not taking a gringo <laughs> to Cuba. Thanks, dad. Not happening. Bernardo Gonzalez who did take me to Cuba, is now the godfather of my children. Oh, my God. Oh, wow. So we have a long history. We spent two weeks there in 1990, which is called the special period in Cuba. It's when the Soviets pulled the money. Uh -huh. And people were lying in the street. There was no gas. There was no work. There was no food. And when I first went to Havana, um, we were there. It was a two-week trip. We spent, I guess, five days in Havana. We rented a car, and we drove most of the island. And... That trip scared me so badly because it felt like there could be revolution. It felt dangerous. It was right on the precipice. It felt like it because people had nothing. And 
They literally were starving. And so I left that trip, and I think a big chunk of life is really about facing fears. Not stupid fears, but... Relevant. That, yeah. yeah, things that, you know... And so I, that place scared me, so I'm like, I got to go back. So Bernard and I went back again, and um, I went in... The Museum of Art has no photography in it, in Havana. It's laid out chronologically, and then there's a separate museum of photography. It's not very big, but it's... And I just sort of got a, a wild hair idea. I was like, God, I'd really love to do a show at the Museum of Photography in Havana. And so Bernardo figured, found out who the director was. Uh, Elaine was her name. And and we managed to get in and get a, uh, an appointment with the assistant curator, Nelson Ramirez. And I brought with me on not, not that trip. We had a meeting. On the third trip, I brought with me um, large, you know, glissé prints mm -hmm. and unrolled them thinking that they're going to be like, yeah, this is fantastic. Good. You got a show. And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah. Glee says he was super dismissive and incredibly Yalo-esque. Having icy. this helmet moment to get. <laughs> no, he was like, he, not only was he incredibly knowledgeable, but he was like, we're the museum and you're the artist. Like, mm -hmm. And so it took, I think it took three years for me to get a show there. Huh. And it was all the rurals, and I had done some Cuban photography, but I, I didn't put um, – I think I only had one, maybe two images out of 25 that were the Cubans. I think it's strange to sometimes show a culture their culture. Mm -hmm. Yes. It, there's something about it that can be fantastic, but there can be something that's sort of like, you naive bastard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, know, yeah. you know, you think that this is representing us, but she's a gal wearing glasses as a prop and the big cigar to get the tourist money. Yeah. That's not who we are. Yeah. So anyway. You're pushing stereotypes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, unintentionally. In, in mono. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, a sidebar on this, uh, the show goes up, I go home, there's a hurricane, it tears the roof off the museum and takes all my show away. And my insurance company paid me for each one of them. Oh. You can do the math. Oh. $3,500 times 25 images. Right? Yeah. That was a nice check. Yeah. That was my most it's successful show. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Hurricane. Who doesn't love Cuba? <laughs> your biggest benefactor was oh, a hurricane. was God. Yeah. <laughs> yes, right. I love your work. Mother Nature. <laughs> I'm going to take it all with me. Yeah. Ta-da. Holy shit. I remember Nelson calling me. He goes, I've got good news and not so good news and bad news. What do you want first? He goes, well, give me the good news. He goes, um, the museum is still standing. <laughs> What's the not so good news? Goes, What's the bad news? He goes, your show is gone. I'm like, what do you mean it's gone? He goes, well, the roof got torn off. and well, anyway. How long was it up there before it got taken away? Did I think it was up for two weeks. Okay, uh, so some people got to see it. and Yeah. Then, okay. But I thought it was amazing that an American insurance company paid off on a country that is on, you know, the I'm, do not trade, right. you know, yeah. trading with the enemy by list. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and that happened. Um, and so I had the show there and I became – pretty good friends with Nelson at that point through this process of that. And I just have to weigh in on it. Cubans, the, the Cubans that I've come to know really well are some of the smartest, funniest, most generous people that I've ever met in my entire life. Hmm. As somebody once put it, we as Americans have so much and do so little with it. And Cubans have so little and do so much with it. Mm, yeah. And they really are a socialist country and have that mentality and are very – I mean, I, I guess the Cubans actually taught me how to hang out mm -hmm. and not be racing off here and there. and, and Slow that. down a little bit, yeah, enjoy life. hang out, listen to music, you mm -hmm. know, tell some stories, have a few laughs, listen to music. And, and that got me. And I think it was probably on my second trip, there's a little – the harbor that leads into Havana is quite large and deep. But off to the side is this little tiny cove. It looks like a kind of a cove you'd pull in in a pirate ship to hide. Mm. <laughs> and when I looked at that, I'm like, I've been here before, or I'm going to be here many times. It, it just resonated with me. And I've been to that cove and swam in it. And there's something about it that speaks to me. And then I started doing... Photography just on water, 
there, mm-hmm. just photographing the seas and kind of the fine artwork. Yeah, look, yeah. just but I love the beach, I love the ocean, um, and trying to make photography look like paintings, which is tricky because mm-hmm. it ain't. Yeah. So I was doing that, and and I I just. I found it to be incredibly ironic to go into a totalitarian dictatorship to feel free. And you're going... And that's what happened to me. Yeah. And, no. and you're at a time that's significantly different than today. Oh, it is so different back then. And, you know, that when I first went to Cuba, a Cuban could barely speak to me on the street without being interrogated by the police. Mm. They couldn't go into hotels. They had no cell phones. They could have no contact with tourists. I mean, it was... Truly two completely different worlds. Um, but I was able to have contact with Nelson because I was there on official getting a show. And, and, and so we could spend time together and talk. And, you know, it's pretty rare when somebody tells you something that can get them imprisoned. Yeah. You know, and I was like, wow. In, the, in Canada, United States, what could somebody tell me that could get them in prison? Okay, yeah, I, I'm a drug dealer or I'm this. I was going to say, politically, yeah, Mark, Mark Emery found yeah. that out. <laughs> right, click. <laughs> <laughs> so... I, I just started resonating with me and that idea of this idea of being freedom where there's no internet, there's no cell phone, you're you're completely off, you know, the way of checking in. And and um, I found that to be really delicious. I, I loved it. I loved hmm. being off the radar. It's a fresh sense yeah. of independence. Yeah, and my friend Ramsey Batista said to me, he's like, yeah, yeah, Jock, you're really free here. He goes... Cuba looks really different when you have a ticket to leave. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh-huh. Uh-huh. That's a good point. It's, it's like it's like kids it's, uh, being an uncle. I, I can give them back. Right, <laughs> they're adorable little kids. Yeah, yeah. yeah. when, you yeah, when you're done, back. you get on the aircraft yeah. and you yeah. leave. Yeah, you still yeah. got a receipt. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, and the you know it's a real cross pollination place. There, the people are beautiful. I mean, when you get that mulatta green eyes and that mm-hmm. that Lenny Bruce, when he said, I don't understand prejudice, he goes, why don't we just fuck ourselves all to a good medium brown and be done with it? <laughs> yep, yep. Yeah. And then the police, clink. And it's it's very much like that. And uh, uh, I, I just really became at, at first infatuated with uh, uh, with Cuba. and uh, And then I fell in love with it, you know. All right. Sorry, everybody. I just want to interrupt real quick and give a nod to our sponsor, Glass Key Photo. These guys help keep our mics hot and the crowds coming in. So this is San Francisco's premier analog photography shop. And whether you're looking for film, film cameras, camera repairs, or if you just want to pick up some amazing zines created by artists right here in the Bay Area, this is the place to go. They even host a number of events, including photo walks, group critiques, or even just stop in for some all-around great conversation. Located now right off Van Ness Street in Midtown, you can find the store at 1230 Sutter Street. They're open seven days a week from 12 p.m. to 6 p.m., and it's ran by two of the greatest guys we know, Gordon and Matt. So when you're in San Francisco, definitely stop on by Glass Key Photo and say hello from all of us here at Street PX. Now let's get back to the show. You, and you mentioned Batista there, Ramsey's Batista. Mm-hmm. And uh, am I correct in saying that um, I, I noticed something? You had worked with Alex Castro, uh, yeah, the son of Fidel yeah. Castro, and he was working on a, a fo- photography related workshop and everything. Alex right? Castro is a photographer. Yes, he's the son of Fidel Castro. Mm-hmm. Exactly. That's that seems so fascinating to me. It just you want to kind of play well, on that? Yeah, a I, bit? Uh, yeah. So I met Alex Castro mm-hmm. through Ramsey Batista, mm-hmm. and Ramsey Batista is a descendant of Batista the dictator. Okay, and oh. they're friends. I know. When I clicked, when that came together, I was wow, like... Wow, that's so... <laughs> and I had met Alex a few times and wow. at uh, one of his exhibitions. And then, um, uh, anyway, we kept kind of... It's not a very big place. Right, right. In, in a sense. So, and then the idea was proposed to do a workshop with Ramsey's and Alex and me and Stuart from The Image Flow. And so we did that, and it was very successful. And um, that was uh, another time where I became more acquainted with Alex. But um, there's a, a photographer named Eric Pulitzer who hired me to take him in to get underneath the curtain 
to do a big project on the transvestite transsexual scene of Havana. And we did this project and it was like 14 trips to do it. And when I think when we'd started, it, it was sort of illegal to, to do it. And then Muriel Castro, the daughter, got the laws changed. Anyway, so Eric did that project. And then Eric wanted to do a project on the 50 greatest Cuban baseball legends. Mm. And if you're doing b- baseball in Cuba, you get your hand on a political thing. Fidel loved baseball. He played it. It's a political thing because like Puig, who plays for the Dodgers, defected and gets $40 million in the States. But when he's playing for Cuba, he's getting $20 a month. So you've got that social political aspect of, of right. it within the baseball. Mm-hmm. So we started doing this project and we had um, Vargas, who was the head coach for the Industriales, which is the Havana team, being our point lead person, setting up the players and doing the portraits. So we, <clears throat> on our third or fourth trip, I think it was third trip, we're on the major stadium in Havana and we've got Vargas is there and we've got two major players that are inside the stadium and Ramsey Batista's <laughs> with me. Eric's there and <laughs> I'll never forget this as long as I live. Ramsey's looks across the field. He goes, I don't like the look of those guys' faces. And I look up and there are three, I didn't know at the time, colonels in full military uniform charging across the, the stadium and they haul us in, take our passports and basically accuse us of being there, you know, to, you know, take Cuban baseball players out of Cuba and feed them into the States. <laughs> oh, and they grill us. They're like, this interview will be conducted in Spanish. And this is on the record. And if this has real serious consequences, I think at that point, Eric peed in his boot. I'm not convinced. <laughs> I haven't got the truth out of him, but I hit all the blood drain out of him. I mean, it was a bad situation. The chances to fly out are starting to slow yeah, down. And they yeah. got our passports and you're in a, you know, this is a dictatorship. There's going to be no due process. Right. Anyway, Eric just says, I don't speak Spanish, which he doesn't. Uh-huh. And I'm like, I don't speak Spanish either. I mean- <laughs> I don't. I mean, I do, but I don't. I'm yeah. not, a, not a, from a legal standpoint. I right. certainly don't. I speak a little Russian. Anyway, they're just, yeah, they're <laughs> pounding away on the Spanish and, and, and Ramsey's like, well, I'll answer. And then the first question is any money been given to any of the Cuban players to participate in this? And Eric doesn't know what's being said. I know what's being said. The, the true answer is yes. But Ram, Ramsey goes, no, there's been no money exchange. If the answer had been yes, we would have been in jail. Mm-hmm. Long story short, we, they give us back our passports, forbid us to do any more photography, and it's going to be under review. Now, the most critical thing about this is Ramsey's is under the is in the crosshairs. We're going to be let out of the country, but he could go to prison mm-hmm. for aiding foreigners in this. We did have permission to do it. We had gone through Nelson to get the license and approval from the government, blah, blah, blah. The colonels had said we were on a immigration violation, that we had not come in under the same status – on our visa to come into the country that we had for the cultural visa to do the photography. Uh-huh. So they had us on a technicality. Anyway, long story short, Ramsey's pretty nervous. He's like, I got to find out how bad this is. So he calls Alex Castro and we have a meeting, you know, and uh, Alex goes, well, I'll, I'll look into it. And and he did. He said, well, they're really watching you. And But so Ra- Ramsey's being smart goes, well, will you help us with it? So I went on the road for two weeks with Alex Castro driving the island, photographing baseball players with Eric Pulitzer on this. And we became pretty good friends. The best part of this story was after Alex said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I might be in. So on the fourth trip when we came back, Ramsey's texted Alex Castro saying, are you in? Meaning, are you coming with us on the road trip? Mm-hmm. And Alex said, basically, ah, oh, what the fuck? I'm in. <laughs> and he was getting divorced. So he wanted to go on the road trip anyway. He wanted to get the hell out of Dodge. Like, yeah. Yeah. He, he's like, he was super like, he definitely wanted to join the join the ranks. So as we're pulling up in front of the compound to pick Alex up, um, Ramsey's texted saying, are you ready? And the text came back, yo listo. Los tropos es aquí con mi padre y mira la cartones. I'm here, I'm ready. I'm here in the house with my father watching cartoons. <laughs> Do you know what they were watching? What? Scooby-Doo. 
Oh, this Fidel? One. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> it just doesn't get any better That's than that. That's magnificent. That's <laughs> Faces oh, of the Enemy. Oh, my God. Ruby Snack. <laughs> Oh, I mean, man. <laughs> I, it, 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 and then, you know, so I'm oh in God. Guantanamo on their national, we've, you know, been on oh, the road yeah. a, a week and I'm standing on the, the field with Alex and we've been batting some balls mm -hmm. waiting for one of the players to show up. And, you know, we're talking a little bit and, and, uh, I think I said to, I said, Alex, I said, you don't really know very much about me. And, and he goes, and Alex doesn't speak great English, but he speaks probably better English than my Spanish. And he goes, well, that's actually not true. He says, I know you're married and you're going through a divorce and you have two girls and they're 13 and 15 or whatever, 13, 15. And uh, it's not going very well. And you've been to the country a lot. And he sort of lists all these things. I'm like, well, actually you do know quite a bit about me. <laughs> and, uh, and then he, he's a big guy. He's a big guy, you know, shaved head. And if he grew a beard, he would look a lot like his dad, but he keeps it all shaved and his hair. So he kind of puts his arm around me, like, you know, a very fatherly kind of way. And he starts giving me uh, advice about divorce. He's like, you know, be kind, you know, be generous, you know, um, don't respond when you're getting a lot of hate coming down on your head. And, and I, you know, I'm looking up at him listening and, and he, you know, he gives me like six or seven pointers on, you know, div good divorce. I said, have, have you been divorced? He goes, yeah, yeah, a couple times. I said, did you follow this advice? He goes, absolutely not. That's why I know it, it would work. <laughs> this is an interesting I mean, the person to be getting advice, it from. Yeah. You know, divorce advice from the son of Fidel Castro on the baseball field in Guantanamo? Yeah. Come on, people. <laughs> That's so many a once in a lifetime <laughs> thing. <laughs> no. It just, it, or once in no one's lifetime, except for one. You know, smoking cigars and drinking rum with him. I mean, he's just a great guy. Hanging out with a Castro, a Batista. Right. And a Pulitzer. Right. <laughs> right? True. Yeah, yeah, I didn't even think, think about, about the last yeah. name there. Right. Oh, my God. So, you know, Cuba sort of, I mean, I don't have it with me, but I wrote a little statement about it at a certain point about the generosity of Cuba mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, that um, she's opened her soul kind of to me and made me a better person by yeah. the generosity and the eye contact and the ability to be much more in the moment. Um, it's funny making plans with Cubans one or two or three months out. They're like, I, I, why? <laughs> it's just we, we, might, no, we might not all be here. I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, Cuba's kind of like one of those last bastions of a, of a, of a different world. It's just a, a, a different pace, a different speed, a different everything. The most potent thing that i've witnessed is seeing it in 25 years go from pretty much no contact with you know tourists and watching the introduction of the cell phone yeah and watching the screen zombie aspect that we all suffer from and sort of the disconnecting now of now being in two places i'm here looking on my phone, being there and not being either place well. Yeah. And I don't know what we've agreed to with with the cell phone. I'm not sure if we actually ever agreed. Well, we agree every time we get up in the morning and turn it on and look oh, at well, it true. as soon as we wake yeah. up. And when you uh, hit, I agree on the terms and conditions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but in terms of how it impacts our humanity, I'm not sure what That's we've actually agreed yeah. to. I think there are things that are miraculous about it which is the fact that one always now has a, a a camera with you at all times and then a platform of which to share it with immediately mm -hmm. that literally pushes the buttons mm -hmm. uh to enhance the image with the filters and all the contrast and all that and and then send it to people and like this is my life or this is what matters to me and and uh you know i saw a wonderful uh ironically on instagram of a installation piece at the Biennale in Italy, then all it was was a large corner of a room with signs that just said like on it, meaning like collected all these likes, yeah, like to yeah. what end is that? Um, and uh, so on one hand, yes, there is a certain type of connectivity, but I think in the end, it's not very meaningful mm -hmm. in a sense. And so it's, there's this large appearance of substance, but it's hollow. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Well, it, it, we 
we were referencing the opiate addi- addiction and, and, and all of that, I think cell phones or at least social media it, to a point is it, it's you get something out of it, but there's a price to pay. Uh, you know, it's it, you're, you're, as with life, as with life. Exactly. Yeah. There's, there's that kind of you always have to have a sense of um, uh, moderation. Like, I, th- I think that's one of our biggest failures is the sense of uh, of not knowing where that line of moderation Everything is. in moderation, especially moderation. You know, yeah. Especially, <laughs> I mean, you think chocolate. Do you think yeah. alcohol? I'm going to have another sip of coffee while you're talking. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and do that, too, because <laughs> moderation. <laughs> because I was going to say, people do some stupid shit on, yeah. on, on social media. Well, yeah. Oh, it's I also mean, a permanent record. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and they don't realize that. And ten years ago, it's like stay out of my private life, and today it's like take my private life. Yeah. <laughs> I'm wondering if someone is ever going to come forward as a business, like for you know five thousand dollars a year, you're private. Oh, I think it's a big business opportunity. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. But anyway, we are right, way, way off, off topic. topic. <laughs> yeah. I think it's a good time uh, to go ahead and throw it to Jim for the question. Yes. The question, One, the question that we ask everyone on the show. If you could go back into any moment in time with your camera to shoot, what would it be? Where would it be? Just one event? To any place since the inception of the camera, where would that be? Oh, the inception of the camera, because I would oh, I'd I say the, the inception of the camera. Because I would yeah. say the crucifixion of Christ. Yeah, yeah. We, we, or, no, yeah. or the money lending scene. We've I mean, been down that road. Yeah, yeah. Before. Okay, yeah. so <laughs> since the invention of the camera? Out, yeah. yeah, since the invention <laughs> of the camera. Wow. On the spot. I know. Well, the greatest portrait that's ever been taken is uh, was taken from the moon of planet Earth. Mm-hmm. So that's a that's a goodie. Who? Well, I think it would have been amazing um, to go back to when Lawrence of Arabia was fighting in the African desert. You know. Yeah. Mm. Um, it put a whole different twist on the, the whole yeah, PR of that yeah. story. <laughs> well, because, you know, he sort of betrayed them, actually, ultimately. Mm-hmm. He used those tribes in, as pawns in that, in that war. And um, I guess if I could uh, go back and throw some weight on uh, War Bad, mm-hmm. that would be, you know... Um, so to demonstrate that narrative, that would whether be it's tent. Gallipoli in the, you know yeah. in Italy or you know the do unfortunately the Matthew Brady of you know one of the great wars yeah um, you know uh, I think that would be somewhere uh, I would go a pivotal figure uh, it's something that says you know when are we going to get this people uh, in a sense that mm-hmm. uh, making the us and them doesn't work. You know, demonizing people, and I think we'd apply that to the current age. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's the yeah. oldest trick in the book, which is you know to point out the differences between groups to control them, right. divide and conquer. Yeah, and uh, and it works mm-hmm. because you know the the lizard brain is like, who are my people? <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> who are the lizard people? And all you got to uh, do is just you know go to any news site today or turn on any television to see that in action. Real yeah, the fear mongering, mm-hmm. um, right? Yeah, I uh, one of the things that I've been experimenting with is taking still photographs and having people morph into each other. And if you go on my website, it's called the One World Portrait Project. And if I would plug anything on my website, it would be that because uh, I did an uh, an opening in Los Angeles where I invited a hundred people, and I think like a hundred fifty people showed up to a small gallery, um, <clears throat> and uh, in Los Angeles. And I photographed 75 of these people and then uh, morphed them into each other and then projected it on the wall and then filmed people's reactions. That was the exhibition. And Mm. it was called Us is the Plural of You. And I wanted to see and hear from people what that was like. Mm -hmm. And I actually labeled this thing synthetic compassion. Um, I don't really like the word synthetic, but it's, it's sort of manufactured in a sense and there were some very poignant things that came out of it. A nine-year-old boy sat and watched the loop of of the morphing of us as the plural of you. He must have seen it like nine times. And then his father is like, we got to go. And he had this huge tantrum. He's like, I got to see it again. No. And his father was like, well, why? 
why do you want to see it so many times? What is it? And I was standing right there. He said, I want to see me turn into you again, hmm. his father. Oh. And then there was an older gentleman in his 60s who turned into this fairly young, beautiful woman. And, and he turned to her. He goes, was it as good for you as it was for me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. And, and the room became community. Yes, Discussions popped up. Strangers yeah. became yeah. And, no longer strangers. I mean, it's quite powerful to see yourself turn into another human being. Uh-huh. Particularly somebody you have no idea you who have, they are. You don't know anything about them. Yeah. yeah. Or a and, father, son to father. Yeah. And so if I was to plug anything, uh, go take a look at it. Um, I'm plotting and scheming about how to expand that. I, I urge people to go see this because it is mesmerizing. It's about what, 17, 15, 17 minutes? No, it's not that long. It's a little over five minutes. Okay. And okay. it's been referred to, and I love this term, the Huma Lava Lamp. Ah, That's fitting. Interesting. That's apt. Yeah, that is. <laughs> yeah, because have you seen this yet? No, I have not seen it's, it It's yet. a very kind of um, liquefied uh, transition that's happening. What mm-hmm. I mean is it's smooth. The transition is proper. Right. It's not... Jolting like you see those uh, the the cliche um, slideshow style, yeah. you know, the- or when Michael Jackson did in, in Black and White when they shook their faces and it would go to the next They're one, right. right. Yeah, this this is done very slowly and uh, gradually. Yeah, which which makes it that much more. The moment you realize you're on a different person, it's just it hits you every time. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah, and there's like where does the one person begin and the other start? It, yep. it, it, it's yeah. quite interesting. It's also. It's a little bit of a fairy tale where you see a very old woman in the end turn into a younger, kind of a younger, beautiful girl. and Mm -hmm. and, uh, Which makes it very emotional for those people, I'm sure, as well. Yeah, and that's been projected at the Biennale in in Havana. It's been shown a lot, and I've given away probably, I don't know, 5,000 discs of it, just free, just... Hmm. It's, I think it was. it's just as beautiful as it is eerie, to be honest. Yeah. No, it is. It's not. Yeah, yeah. It has, I don't think it has a high creep factor, but no, there no, is no, a no, little no. bit. It's, it's uh, just, you're not really sure what you're looking at at first. And then once it clicks, you're just, that's whenever you're blown away. Yeah. I think that's the best way I can explain it. Yeah. That's how yeah. it hit me, at least. Well, you think of the little boy. Yeah. Yeah. And his reaction. His father. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we're adding the link on this uh, to the show notes, which actually, that's that's one thing it brings me to, is where can people find out more information about you and see more of your work online? Well, I guess the best is just on my website, which is jockmcdonald.com. Perfect. Easy, simple. <laughs> and I like to say it's, it's McDonald MC, because we had to sell the A to get a potato, which we baked and made into a canoe to get from Ireland to Canada. <laughs> So that's what happened. Yeah, today. and then okay. we'll, yeah. had to drop that one as soon as you landed. <laughs> <laughs> well, right, Jimbo, where can we find out more information oh, about you? As always, jimwatkinsphoto.com and all my uh, links to social media platforms are right there. Fantastic. And you can find out more information about me at recasper.com. That's where all of my blog posts, any workshops that I have going on, uh, which actually, just to kind of circle back real quick, if you go to Jock's website and, and search him up online, Jock's also an educator and has uh, workshops. Yeah, periodically. Yeah. Yep. So, There's um, a workshop coming up through the Image Flow in Mill Valley, which is, uh, I think, two weeks and uh, a intimate uh, look at India, northern India. Hmm. Excellent. So that is, uh, again, at the Image Flow in Mill Valley uh, in uh, February of uh, 2018. Perfect. Nice. So definitely go and take a look there. And also go and take a look at streetpx.com. That's where you're going to find all of our past episodes, uh, any of our blog posts that are talking about contests, all of that's going to be there. And we're well past the 50 mark now and heading over toward uh, heading toward 100. There you go. And we don't plan on stopping anytime soon. Uh, so if you do want to help us keep these mics hot and the bandwidth flowing, do go over to patreon.com forward slash streetpx and you can give a buck, you can give five bucks, whatever you feel comfortable. All that money goes right back into keeping this show going and it's not something for nothing you can get a t-shirt you can get uh, portfolio reviews prints whatever uh it's just dependent on the tier system uh outside of that you can also buy t-shirts at the merch store it's merch.streetpx.com and that's it i just want to give a big thank you to jock for coming on the show here you're so welcome yeah, thank, thank you guys for uh tolerating our me pleasure our <laughs> pleasure <laughs> and i want to thank all of our audience out there for sticking with us and we'll see or rather we'll talk at you in two weeks cheers take it easy